Thank you, David. Um, it's a real pleasure and an honor for me to be talking today at the 50th anniversary of the EMS and the EMGS. So I thank both uh, Errol and, and David for inviting me and including me on this talk. I've been a, a member for a long time, uh, I guess I should say. I started, I think, at the San Diego meeting, in, I think it was like 1979. Been to most of the meetings, and I have to say, a lot of the stuff that I've done in my professional career has been influenced by a lot of the interactions and the discussions that I've heard at the um, EMGS meetings. And so I think this is a worthwhile society, and I'm so glad I've been part of it. So um, I'm going to try to give you a little bit of the regulatory aspects of things. Uh, you've been hearing most about the, the history and the science, but uh, one of the founding tenets of the EMS was talking about the regulatory aspects of that. So, uh, in particular, there was a big focus on the, uh, the germ cell. So, I'm going to try to give a little quick introduction to the early uh, focus on the germ cell mutagenesis, mutagenesis from the, uh, the society. We'll look at some of the heritable risk guidances, and I'll finish up with a slide on the future for heritable risk efforts. So, it's be sort of a 30,000 ish uh, perspective on all of this. If you just go to the website and you look at the mission, it's already placed with. Uh, listed there from the uh, EMGS, you can see that, that they really look at a lot of the aspects of the uh, of mutagenicity, but really one of the main ones in my mind are the a, a focus on the heritable effects and the relevance to disease. And the idea here is to protect human health and the environment. And I think that's a worthwhile, lofty goal, and we should still adhere to that. It's really guided my professional career, to be very honest. Uh, in the origins of the EMGS, again, just pulled from the website, talks about, you know, it's a forum for the establishment, support of scientists, but its initial focus was on germ cell mutagenesis. And that still carries through to today, I think. It's kind of ebbed and flowed over the years, but I have to say sort of a resurgence, I think, in the interest of that. It does now include a lot of other aspects of mutagenicity, but I want to focus on the germ cell part. Out of the early days, uh, I think David mentioned, uh, referred to this, was this uh, EMS at the time, Committee 17 paper, which published in Science. And it's really uh, an important first position paper by the, uh, by the society that talked about research needs and regulatory responsibility. Again, I'm talking about regulatory responsibility. But they make it very clear that their primary concern is with the genetic health of future generations. Therefore, we should focus upon germline mutations. Again, a very important focus. Soon after the, that paper came out, there was a committee, this working group on mutagenicity testing under the uh, Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, that sort of helped advise the government at the time about you know, what we can do in terms of mutagenicity risk assessment. They published a report that was given to the, uh, the DHEW Committee to Coordinate Toxicology Regulatory Programs under their subcommittee of environmental mutagenesis. But again, if you read through that, their primary objective of mutagen testing to determine whether a chemical has potential to cause heritable genetic alterations in man. Again, it's really this heavy focus on the future generations. So, now get back into my experience in the, in the, in the uh, regulatory scheme of things. The EPA went ahead and published a whole series of guidelines for different endpoints, cancer, developmental, whole repo, and things like that. But there was a mutagenicity one as well, not as well known as the cancer guidelines, for example, from EPA. But uh, it came out and essentially was trying to do, in a simple sense, build on the strength of the evidence to try to build a case for the bearing of, for the potential of human germ cell mutagenicity. And so there was an assessment of the potential germ cell mutagenic risk. And we went through all the studies and everything that we had to, to, to judge and look, and, uh, look at and uh, you know, try to figure out, okay, is there a problem or not? If you look at the guideline, it doesn't really talk about cancer or anything like that. It talks about germ cell risk. I'm not going to read through all these levels. But the most, every one of these practically levels of uh, trying to like, label whether there's a germ cell risk or not talks about germ cell mutagenicity. 
And so even the first one that talks about positive data on human germ cell mutagenicity studies, again, as Carol said, we don't have, we haven't found a proven, well-known human germ cell mutagen yet, but that's the highest level of evidence that says, yes, there's a real problem. And that's the number one thing in the mutagenicity guideline. And then you can see it just sort of notches down from the different levels of evidence on how much you want to say that there's a real problem to the germ line. Anybody who's seen any talk, I usually present this particular battery slide. This was the original battery we had in 1991, which, my, which I published uh, with my colleagues at EPA, including Mike Simino and Andrew Aletta, some people who probably know are also members of the society. But this built upon a lot of the uh, earlier testing schemes and, and the knowledge that we were actually getting from the EMS and all the different discussions and talks we had there. So you, you heard a lot of that about uh, the earlier ones from your comparable. But this is actually now, even though it's 1991, it's still the current testing battery. And I also want to say is that that article that I had published was one of the first times, and maybe the only time, that EPA took the disclaimer off. And this is actual policy of the EPA, this article. And so what it describes is essentially a tiered system for germ cell and heritable risk. With Above the dotted line, and Mike Simino, by the way, put this slide together a long time ago, is essentially the screening battery. That's just to say yes or no, is there, is there a mutagenic activity or not? But what's important to realize is that once you have figured out that there's some type of mutagenic activity, the next step is to actually go into the germ cells, start looking for evidence for germ cell interaction, and ultimately with the last two at the bottom, to try to run these assays to quantitate the risk that's an important point. We haven't really quantitated the risk very much. I think you heard from Paul, we're going to start talking a little bit more about quantification techniques. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what we did early on. The problem is that those last two assays aren't done anymore. Uh, and also, as you've heard from some of the earlier speakers, that the initial testing battery at the top there sort of became sort of like the screen for cancer or bioassays whether it supported a cancer case or not. So this sort of withered away, this emphasis. And I'm sorry to say, I wish it hadn't. <laughs> but I'm hoping now that the society is now rebuilding their, their uh, focus back on mutagenicity. We won't be able to win these particular tests anymore, but hopefully with new technologies, we'll be able to start looking at the heritable risk again. So again, this is still the current battery. There's a couple of modifications I could in vivo cytogenetics is now in vitro uh, alternative to be used. Now to go into the quantitation of uh, heritable risk, we, we uh, work with this uh, International Commission for Protection Against Environmental Mutagens and Carcinogens. I don't know how many people here are familiar with the Pickham back then. Um, but with this group of people, which I think is a dynamic group of uh, thinkers in this regard, and I've included a lot of people from from the society, and I think George Douglas is here, is one of the people. Uh, what we did was we were tasked from the ICPEM to write up a report that describes the model for producing a quantitative genetic risk assessment for human populations. So this was a, a daunting task, but we uh, went through the literature, literature, and so we came up with a case study. I was working on acrylamide at that time, in the Office of Toxic Substances when I was at uh, EPA. And we were finding that there were a lot of uh, workers working uh, in the, the sewers and trying, using uh, acrylamide as a concrete grout to fill out uh, holes and stuff like that. So we had tried to figure out, is there an actual risk to these workers? So we went ahead and published this review article again with these really amazing people, like Udo Ailey, uh, Gary Shea, George again. And David Brusick was sort of behind the scenes of a lot of this. And so we went ahead and did it. We used heritable translocation data that was being done at the time. But from that ICPEM paper, we had to go through a lot of different thought processes to try to get to an understanding of how we're actually going to do the quantitation. So we looked at three different types of uh, methods. There's a parallelogram approach, which you all are, you know, pretty there was a direct approach, a doubling dose approach. 
Tulsa Grove Ave. I really liked it a lot. Um, I won't go into any of these. There's too much to talk about what, what goes behind this. But what, what's really difficult to do is try to figure out all these factors, whether the germ cell stage specificity, the DNA repair variability, locus specificity, number of human loci associated with dominant lethal diseases. You know, we were talking about dominant uh, uh, associated diseases. This doesn't even take into account the recessive. So everything we're talking about here is a very big underestimate. We look at three exposure scenarios. Was inhalation and thermal for the ground workers I mentioned about, and also ingestion for drinking water. Because acrylamides actually use a flocculant in the big water tanks that you see out there to clarify the water. So every time you drink something, you're drinking acrylamide. And this was all before we found out there was acrylamide in the French fries. So <laughs> to make a long story short, we, we, we went ahead upon the doubling dose approach as most preferable because the data most amenable to that. So we used uh, Udo Hedling's data, uh, Ilsevere Adler's data, data, and Mike Shelby's data from heritable translocation. I'm not going to ask you to read this slide, but we looked at the three different uh, exposure scenarios for ingestion, for example. We found that up to three offspring are potentially affected with induced genetic disease per 10 to the 8th offspring. So here's an actual quantification of who, what is being, who is being affected, three offspring and that amount of people. If you multiply that by the number of people who actually do drinking water, you might start thinking about we actually have a little bit of a problem here. And as that, as that gene pool expands, it could even become a bigger problem. This, I think, is the first, maybe the only real quantitation of heritable genetic risk I found that I know of. If anybody else has anything, let me know. But even with this, the genetic uh, the quantification stuff that Paul is talking about, it really doesn't get down to looking at the offspring. It just tells you what it might be a quote an acceptable level. And by the way, if you're going to be using the benchmark test, I don't think you have to talk about threshold of all Paul, because it doesn't even apply, to be very honest. The benchmark approach goes over, leaps over that, just to decide. Um, the problem we have was that the, uh, the grout workers actually had higher exposure based on this table. So what I want to emphasize is that not only did we do the quantitative analysis, it actually influenced a regulatory decision. So this is an example where actually we did really do work, and it worked for the thing. So for the drinking water office, they came up with this treatment technique to try to keep the level of acrylamide down in the tanks. And, and then for the grout work, we tried to uh, prohibit the use of the grout use, but it turns out they came back with a protective clothing, so we were able to uh, uh, pull back on that particular thing. Last thing before I get to the future slides, we talk about uh, you know what's going on now. There is also an effort on the labeling of, of compounds that are out there, and this is called uh, the GSA, the globally organized system of classification and labeling chemicals. It talks about all the different toxicities, but for the mutagenicity part of this labeling, it only talks about germ cells. My colleague Mike Simino is one of the ones that helped uh, develop this before they uh, started to, when they were working on generating this. Again, I don't want you to read that slide. What it says is that for these category one ones, substances that are known to induce their limitations, that's what has to be on the label. If, some, if the evidence is there to show that it has that. If it's a category one B, it shows that they should be regarded as if they have heritable mutations in the germ cells of humans. So you can see that the focus is still clearly on germ cells and the heritable risk, even when you're labeling these things. Category two is a little lesser amount. I won't go into this, it's like more look like using animal data, things like that. But I just wanted to say, this is the type of label we're talking about. When you have a category one mutagen, a uh, germ cell mutagen is labeled as a health hazard danger. I mean, that's pretty significant, I would think. And for category two, it's still a warning that there could be a problem. So this is, a, unfortunately, it's not used as much in the United States, even though it's a legal document. The European Union does use this quite, quite, quite a bit, so you have to keep this in mind. So my last slide, just kind of looking, looking ahead, again, listening to the discussions uh, today, yesterday is a workshop on uh, terrible risk from tobacco smoke. I'm in heart, if you will, that we will start to maybe refocus our, 
our society back on term sale risk and heritable risk. Because I think that was really what we most care about. Is yes, we care about you know problems with our own selves, but I think we really do care about our, our children and our grandchildren and how we uh, preserve the environment and everything for them. So you've heard from Carol a lot of these newer techniques, fascinating term cell, transgenics, toxicogenomics, flow cytometry. I think these are all fabulous things to determine, you know, if you have a real term cell problem. And then you can use, of course, for risk assessment, you can use um, modes of action, uh, adverse outcome pathways for genomic damage to help you focus where do you want to do your testing and see what's most relevant for human health. And again, harking back to Paul's talk, I think these quantitative approaches to model germ cell testing data and use of risk characterization for, for decision making, I think is going to be very critical because if we're going to be really making an impact, we've got to go to the decision makers with the real quantitative information and not just say it's bad because when these people go up and you say, well, it's just bad, they're going to go, well, what do I do about it? Well, if you start getting ideas of quantitation, I mean, well, there might be levels where we can actually Mid some things, there's never an acceptable, discipline, I would say, uh, exposure to a mutagen, but it would be allowable amounts, then that's the way we, we should be going. And so again, harking back to David's article on mutagenicity, we should be looking at mutations as a regulatory point. I don't think there's any reason we should just say, well, it's only if it causes something else that we have to regulate on that something else. I think the mutations are the cause of of a lot of that stuff. So if we can prevent that or reduce the amount of those, I think we're doing a much better job of protecting public health. And so with that, thank you very much.